afternoon, everyone. It is both an honor and a privilege to be sharing my story here with you all today, alongside my Canadian quarterback, and truthfully the first and maybe even only local doctor I really trusted in terms of neuroendocrine cancer care. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you to Dr. Shrin Azat for being there for me every step of the way in my journey. His knowledge, expertise, dedication, passion, kindness, and compassion is matched only by my neurosurgeon. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Azat for all that you do for neuroendocrine patients and their caregivers across Canada. We are so lucky to have you in Toronto, and we welcome you anytime into our dazzle. Not that we want you to be a neuroendocrine patient, but because you always have a seat at our table, because you are a rare doctor. So a big round of applause for Dr. Shrin. been my rock through it all and has always believed in me. It is not easy to be married to someone going through a life-altering health crisis, as many in the audience know. You don't sign up for this, especially in the early years of marriage with little children. And I think in some ways it is easier to be the patient. I am really grateful I have such a supportive, rock-solid partner, so thank you, Eddie. President of CNES, Jackie, for thinking of me for this opportunity. I have been doing a lot of patient, patient advocacy work with individual patients over the last two years. I had a dream to utilize my speaking engagements as a means to reach more people. And this is my first time speaking in front of an, uh, an audience other than my wedding speech. So here goes nothing. <laughs> Storytelling is so powerful, especially when it comes to our healthcare journeys. It's much more than a textbook or a pamphlet. It's personal, it's raw, it's learning from real life examples. Like my kids would say, sharing is caring. It is my goal to have some part of my story impact you today. For the patients and caregivers in the room, you all have an incredible story to share. I hope that you may feel comfort in relating to some part of my journey in solidarity and to feel less isolated in this rare dazzle. Some would call a pack of zebras a herd, but I like dazzle more. For the healthcare providers in the audience, I invite you to open yourselves up to learning something new from the patient's perspective and lived experience. The level and depth of empathy you provide with your care means more than you'll ever know. And as a collective, I would like us all to walk away from these stories that the other ladies will share as well, with a little bit more hope and inspiration in our hearts and a deeper understanding and desire for true healing and not just a cure. Now, before I go back to the beginning of my story, I'll share a letter I wrote myself a few weeks into being diagnosed with an inoperable base of skull paraganglioma tumor. Um, I'm going to be skimming some notes along because I did not memorize this and I did not practice, of course, because I'm a mom of three little girls. So, this is the first time I'm doing it. But it is my story. I don't think I can mess it up. There. August 23rd, 2020. Dear Erica, I know you are really tired. You can't get the sleep you need. You're in so much pain and you're up reading, researching, and messaging with all the other rare neuroendocrine patients from around the world. Feel para what? Your mind is racing, you don't know what to do. Then Layla is up a time or two or three, and maybe Maya needs more water or Mia has a bad dream. You're worried about the kids going back to school, cold and flu season, and of course the increasing fear on the news about the coronavirus. You're worried what will happen if they get sick. What will happen if you get sick? Would you have to stop treatment? If you choose surgery, Will you lose your voice and ability to eat and swallow? You really love to talk and you really love to eat. You, will you have a feeding tube? Will it be temporary or permanently? Will you have a trach? Will you look like you had a stroke? Will you have Horner syndrome? Will you lose hearing on your left side? Will your left arm be limp forever? How would you even have time to go through rehab? You have no extra time to spare. And how awful would it be for the kids to see you this way? Even if you could find someone to operate and they can't get it all, 
grow back? I don't believe that radiation can shrink it down. It won't help the mass effect pain, but could it stop your symptoms or halt the growth? And what about the latent toxicities and side effects? You still have so much life to live. Do you really want to risk a secondary radiation-induced cancer? Would proton beam help spare normal tissue? Are you even eligible for that at 35? Would OHIP cover you to go get it? It's your worst nightmare to have radiation on your head and neck. And it won't take this mass out of your head. You want Tabitha evicted, and you have to find a way. You wish you could speed up the genetic testing. God forbid you've passed this down to your girls. That guilt will eat you alive. Can you get the scans and tests you really need to get the full picture of your diagnosis? This is so rare. What if there are more tumors in your body? They are sneaky and highly misunderstood. You're unsure if you can get the clinical trial you found in the States at the NIH because of COVID. They aren't accepting international patients due to travel restrictions. They also told you you couldn't be breastfeeding if you want to enroll. You can't stop breastfeeding. She's only four months old. The other girl's got 18 months. But you know how much your body needs you right now. No matter what you choose, treatments are going to be demanding. You will need stronger pain management. But you think Layla needs your milk more, then you need the pain management. You feel selfish and guilty for even thinking about weaning her. Deep down, you know she needs your mo her mother to be healthy. All three of them do. The girls need you to battle this with all that you can, with everything you have, so that you can be there for them until you're old or gray. The plan was to live a long, full, healthy life and die very quickly at the end. Not a slow burn on borrowed time, high on painkillers. You worry about Eddie. Marriage is hard enough as it is with three kids, four and under, in a global pandemic, without nearby family or a village of support. How can he handle this with you? Can you make it through this together? He is so strong and steady, thank God. But this is hard. You worry about the girls. You're fighting through the pain trying to have the best days possible with them. You put on a mask and gait every day, taking it off when they're only fast asleep. You have superpowers. Your pain is basically invisible. You hide it so well. But they can sense something is up. They're being extra kind and thoughtful, melting your heart and bringing you to tears. It's like they can read your mind. Those tender exchanges are better than any meditation or medication, but you know in your heart you're going to have to share a kid-friendly version of the truth someday, very soon. I know you're scared, but you're actually doing a really good job. I know no one tells you, but you really are, and you've got this. You will get through this one day at a time. One scan, one test, one treatment. Be gentle with yourself. It's okay to cry. Let those tears out. Let yourself break fall apart, and pick yourself back up, dust yourself off, and get back out there. Find the good doctors, the ones who look at you like a whole person, with a before and an after this diagnosis. Functional medicine practitioners who consider the full picture of your mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual health. The ones who believe you, and they believe in you. Find the complementary medicines. Drink more water, go to bed earlier, get fresh air, move your body, get in some nourishing meals, even if you're not capable of cooking them. Move your body a lot and accept the help. Just say yes, okay? There's no medal for doing this alone. Just keep going, keep living. You're surviving now, but you will thrive again on the other side of this mountain. You're stronger than you'll know, you see. A few days pass and I write a little bit more. This time will be different. This time, I will help myself. I will find a way to get through this painful, debilitating ball of pent-up pain out of my body. I will do the work. I will learn why it came. I will grow. I will be courageous and hold strong. I will persevere and believe in myself, and I will form a team of people who truly care and believe in me. 
I will unearth painful truths and discover wounds that were never fully healed. I will be open to receiving emotional support and connection. And I will love my children even harder. I will come back home to myself. I will share lessons along the way and spread messages of advocacy, hope, and faith over fear. I will be grateful for it all. I won't need this ball of painful fire anymore to remind me how to take care of myself as a whole. To shed limiting beliefs and outdated burdens, I will fight for myself every step of the way. I am strong, confident, competent, brave, and fearless, and I will overcome the obstacles. I will advocate so hard for what I want and what I deserve. I will make them question their limitations and decisions based on policy, funding, and fear. I will find the healers, and I will find the best surgeon to do the impossible. They will be the most experienced in this region and have the confidence and unconditional courage and faith that I have in myself. I will conquer both sides of the mountain and I will leave a trail. I will clear the bush, flatten the earth, widen the path, and put up signs all along the way. Signs of hope and encouragement. Detailed maps of pit stops and roadblocks with faith over fear billboards along the way. My story will trailblaze this inoperable diagnosis and it will be part of someone else's survival guide. Inoperable just meant unstoppable. It will be hard, but it will finally be the right kind of hard. It's always darkest before the dawn. I will be the light when it's dark. I will be the light when there is none, and I won't stop until I'm free. A cure is never guaranteed. I may never be cured, but my God, I will heal. So, this is my why. Uh, these are my girls when I was diagnosed. Um, so my newborn was three and a half months old, and my middle had just turned three, and my eldest was four and a half. And I'm not quite sure that I would have done everything I did if it wasn't for them. There is no love like a mother's love. You would die for your children, but would you live for them? So here I am before I was diagnosed. Um, and I had been having symptoms that were seemingly not related for about 10 years, a whole decade before my diagnosis. I was having severe GI attacks, and headaches, dizziness, nausea, um, and then came along a chirping heartbeat that I only heard in my ear when I was pregnant, and vertigo episodes got more severe and increasing in occurrence, blurred visions, migraines, especially after working out. Um, and then I found out I was pregnant again with baby number three. And suddenly, all of my symptoms turned into, oh, you're pregnant, you're breastfeeding, are you stressed, you're a young mom, are you sleeping? Do you wanna try some anxiety medication? Do you wanna download a meditation app? No, I'm not stressed, I'm not anxious, I'm cool. I do meditate, I do yoga. Something's really wrong. So I asked for some heart haltering medication, uh, heart halter, and but nothing came up. I checked out as just a healthy young mom who needed to get more sleep. Then when Layla was born, everything got better when she came out. The hospital was a very quiet, peaceful place to have a baby in 2020. Um, once we got home, I got about three months of feeling good. I got a fourth trimester, really, to recover and rest, as much as one can do with two other kids. But after I passed the fourth trimester mark, I started to not feel very well again. Um, I started to getting dizzy, nauseous, lightheaded, and um, I tried my first workout, and I went down to my husband's office after I did that, and I said, I'm not feeling well at all. I think I'm coming down with a flu. Maybe could we finally have COVID? I don't know. The next few days, things got worse. My head started to hurt really badly. My head and neck started to hurt really badly. I was in so much pain, but it was really hard to see a doctor at that time. It was really hard to even get a virtual appointment. Nobody's going to their doctor 
in August 2020. It's virtual or the emergency department, and you're not going to the ER unless you're dying or need a ventilator. Um, so I put my credit card into Maple, which was a new app at the time, and I did a virtual doctor's appointment. I wrote up my symptoms and I waited for the doctor to show up on the screen. From what I had Googled, I was having a severe tension headache with a migraine. It was reminiscent of the ones I'd had while I was pregnant, but the last two weeks it was getting stronger and they weren't stopping. And I was wondering, am I dehydrated? Is it just from breastfeeding? Is my posture pure? Maybe I just need a massage. Um, so I was prescribed anti-migraine medication and I ordered myself a massager from Amazon and I started those two things knowing that that probably wasn't going to be the solution. Um, a few days later, I went for another doctor's appointment virtually and the doctor said to me, you need to get to the emergency department now. You're having the worst headache of your life. You need to go right now. How can I go? I can't go to the emergency department right now. It's COVID. Nobody's going to the hospital. She said, you really need to go right now. So when I got there, when I was with the triage nurse, I said, I'm having the worst headache of my life. And I wouldn't be here unless I thought it was very serious. So she booked the scanner right away. And without even seeing a doctor, I went right for a CT scan. I said to the tech, I'm actually a tech too. So can you kind of give me like a wink or a nut or a nod if there's something there? And after the scan was over, he said, does your neck hurt too? And I said, yeah, really badly. He said, I think I saw something on the inferior border of your scan, but they only ordered a head scan. So I'm going to get them to order a head and neck scan next. Unfortunately, the nurses that were working with me said, you can't go in for that scan with the contrast, you're breastfeeding. What? Come on, it's 2020, of course I can. Well, if you, do you want me to pump? Yes, please, you have to, have, you have to do a pump right now. So I waited for a pump to come. The CT staff were leaving. It was almost midnight. They made me pump my milk before I got the scan. But fortunately, I was able to do the scan with the contrast. And sure enough, I left with a diagnosis. I left Michael Guerin Hospital with a preliminary report. There's a mass close to your carotid bifurcation, and it's raising suspicion of a left carotid paraganglioma can be associated with headache, but no other intracranial could, patient could acutely see in this presentation. Semi-urgent elective MRI is requested, and you have a tentative appointment booked tomorrow. I go home and I Google paraganglioma and other differential diagnosis. I learn I am a zebra. The phone rings the next day, and the doctor says he can't look at me because he doesn't know these types of tumors, and my referral will be sent back to someone else and I should expect a call in the next few days. Then my chart is passed around like a hot potato, which I'm sure most of you guys have experienced at one point in time or another. Nobody can help me, nobody sees this. I learn what it is to be rare, and I learn that I am a zebra. After many ER visits on recommendations from my family doctors, I finally have some appointments lined up. I am back where I trained as a student now. What a trip. I am now the patient. I am mistaken for staff at the hospital. Excuse me, staff, come to this lineup, yells the screener from behind the layers of plexiglass and masks. Ah, uh, no, I'm a patient today. I have to go to all my appointments alone because of COVID policies, and I bring home a big orange jug. I instruct the kids that it is not juice. I get more blood work than I've ever had in my lifetime. I see all of the elderly cancer patients without their supports. They have no advocate, no one to hold their hand, no one to help them in the elevator ask questions. And all of the beautiful resources that I, I knew as a, as a healthcare practitioner, I couldn't suggest these for myself because they were closed for COVID. It was a very lonely and depressing time and we aren't supposed to go, these, go through these things alone. Here I am as a student I was planning out a mock radiation therapy treatment for a head and neck patient. I jokingly put on the mask with my friend. We were both training at Princess Margaret Hospital in our clinical rotations. The head and neck unit is my least favorite unit. It really hurts to see the patients waste away before they finally get their feeding tube put in. They shrink, they get pale, they get tired, their mouths get sores and dry. They can't eat, they can't speak very well. 
you make them suffer so much. I never want to get head and neck radiation. I would rather die. Well, I'm told that my tumor is inoperable. The door is closed. The door is closed again and again and again and again. The door is now locked and it's even boarded shut. I tried everyone. I tried every doctor I could find in Canada and Toronto and even lots across in the US. We just don't do this anymore. As a group, we've decided it's not worth the risk. But what if I want to? What if I want to take the risk? You'd probably find someone to operate. Someone will tell you they will take it out, but they just want your money. They don't care what you look like afterwards. They don't care what your life is like afterwards. Do not do it. Radiation has excellent local control. Well, how old are the patients that you're radiating? 60, 70, and 80. Well, I'm 35, and I am symptomatic. Radiation might be a good option if I didn't have these symptoms and I didn't have a long life ahead of me. But the radiation appointments were booked and without me even consenting. My dental appointment was booked, my mass fitting appointment was booked, and I said, stop, I'm not doing radiation. And if I do, I need to at least try to get a photon beam. I want to survive and I want to thrive. So in the meantime, I need some pain relief and I need to find someone who understands what I'm dealing with here. I need to figure out if I have a genetic mutation and I need the gallium head scan. What if it's not even a paraganglioma? If I can't biopsy it and I can't do the normal workup for that we do for normal tumors, how do I know that this is even a paraganglioma? I ask to be referred to Dr. Izzat. We meet at PMH and he knows what he's talking about. He will try to get me the PET scan and there are treatment options if my tumor lights up. I get my MRI, I get my gallium dotate PET scan, and my tumor, as you can see, lights up like a Christmas tree. I then find out I have the SDHC mutation, and I find, unfortunately, that two of my children have it as well. They have inherited that from me, which is probably a mother's worst nightmare. Dr. Izat calls me after the results of my PET scan. Can you come now? He says, we might be able to try something. I go and we discuss lanreotide. It might help the pain and symptom relief. It's worth a try. But there's a caveat. You have to stop breastfeeding. I myself read all of the trials. I don't feel comfortable nursing with it being excreted in the milk. So I nursed my baby girl for the last time that night. She was taking bottles of pump milk when I was out of all my appointments, no problem. But it was always someone else. And unless you've breastfed, you don't know how it feels. It's a peace and serenity. It's a quiet space and a rush of happy hormones. And it's a way of feeling like you're doing something useful when you're otherwise feeling pretty useless and out of commission. So I was wondering, do I really need this pain relief? Should I put off trying lanreotide? I try giving her a bottle of milk myself and I cry a lot. This is very hard. But I am ready to try lanreotide. It's almost $3,000 per shot if you've ever taken it. I do have coverage, but I'm wondering, what about the people who don't have coverage? How are they affording to pay for this medication? The inequities in the healthcare system are getting to be apparent now. I am English, I am white, I am competent, I'm confident, I have a medical background, I have money to pay for parking at Princess Margaret, I have benefits from meds, support at home, I don't have to work right now. But what about other people? What are they doing? How are they navigating this? Who is supporting them? We are all in the same storm, but we are in very different boats. And that's what COVID felt like to me too. Same storm, very different boats. This is balance testing, if any of you have had it. So I was getting increasing episodes of vertigo, swooshing sounds. It sounded like a helicopter was landing in my head every day. I knew it was my tumor, but a few people didn't think so. So I had to go through this balance testing and it was not fun. It was torturous. If you've gone through it, you know. After a month or two of lanreotide injections, my GI symptoms got really bad. The nausea was debilitating and I was weak and sick. 
I had to go to the hospital and nobody knew what a paraganglioma was there. Nobody even knew what lariatide was. I had to repeat my story over and over again to every nurse and doctor I came in contact with. And that was frustrating, time consuming, and made me feel even more prepared. And I see a lot of heads nodding, so I think some other people have felt the same way before. While in the hospital, I saw a lot more problems. What are we feeding our patients? How can we heal if we have to eat this? I can Uber eat healthy food, and I have friends dropping off but I'm just wondering about what everyone else is eating. There's not a lot I can do, so I order the staff some dinner, and I hope that that helps. And being an impatient uh, over the Christmas holidays during COVID 2020 was not a fun experience. I had to FaceTime my children and husband, and um, I broke some COVID rules too. This is a picture of a 92-year-old woman, Hand, who was dying in our hospital bed beside me. She had no family around, no support, um, and I was able to get her husband's and daughter's phone numbers. So I called them and they spoke briefly. And I'll never forget his voice saying, I love you, my dear, I hope I see you soon. But unfortunately, I'm not quite sure that they saw each other before she passed away. Um, I switched over from Landriotide to Octriotide. It was cheaper, but much less convenient, and a lot less side effects. And this was the beside my bedside every night, full of pain medications and needles, and I got them very, very small. This is after a 911 call. Um, if you've had one of these episodes before, you know kind of what it feels like. It feels like a stroke or a heart attack. back home, unfortunately, my dog seemed to take some of my pain away. I don't know if you guys have any pets that have taken on some of that pain. Yes. So my 15-year-old girl took on some of my pain, and she decided it was her time to pass away. Um, and it was at that time I kind of started to question, am I truly even living anymore in this kind of pain? My symptoms were out of control, and I didn't look sick. And that, that was a really hard thing to have this invisible pain. And again, I see a lot of heads nodding. I know a lot of you know what this feels like right now. And all of this really prompted me to question, should I go get the surgery I know I really want to need? And these are some of my friends that I would meet for socially distanced coffee and drinks. And they gifted me with this locket of a picture with my three girls. And it was then that I said, maybe it's time to go. Maybe it's time to go get surgery. I reached out to Dr. Liu, who's in Rutgers in New Jersey, and set a surgery date. We had been in touch for many months before, and he gave no pressure and was just kind and caring and listened and was a shoulder for me. And we booked the surgery for less than a month after that phone call. I was scared, I was excited, and I was ready. I'm trying to figure out if, you, if I can even travel now because the city keeps closing down as does the country, but I'm going to try my best to go. My friends gathered together at night to make some bracelets for our friends and family to wear while we went away. We created Team Erica and it was formed by Dr. Liu as well. We beaded bracelets and we sent them all around the world. I told my kids what I was about to do them and coached them and, and told them what they would be expecting when mommy came home from surgery. I explained that I would look like I had a very cool haircut and that I needed to get to the best doctor to get this tumor out of my head. This was my daughter's first birthday, April 24th, 2020. I was flying out the next day from surgery. I had a really hard time singing happy birthday that night because it was the last time I might ever sing again. I snap pictures and take some videos, and it's time to say goodbye. I'm crying, I pack up, I don't want to leave, but it's time to go. In the morning, I'm ready. I say my goodbyes, I head to Pearson. Customs is a breeze. There's nobody there. <laughs> the hotel is quite far away from the hospitals because of COVID, and I decide, instead of going in Ubers over and over again, I'm gonna rent myself a red, narrow, without a roof. 
and I drive around singing at the top of my lungs and preparing myself for very big surgery. My friends had a healing energy circle a few nights before my surgery. It was incredibly special and powerful. My husband flies in, I pick him up in a convertible, and we go for a fancy dinner. It's really strange to think that it could be our last dinner. Um, and our last dinner is actually just pizza and beers under a bridge, and it was perfect. I am at the top of the mountain, and I made it, and I did it, and I'm ready for surgery. I'm in pre-op alone here, and I see this zebra on the bracelet, and I think it's a pretty good sign for us zebra patients. This is after my embolization. As you can see, it was extremely successful. This is me after the embolization. Uh, Tabitha, which was my tumor, was pretty pissed about the embolization because we caught the blood supply. My surgery was, in fact, miraculous. This is the before and after. This is Tabitha, the tumor, and it's exactly how I imagined her. These days are all kind of a blur, um, but I got through them <laughs> with that Eva on my side. It was, in fact, a miraculous surgery. My cranial nerves were all spared. My surgeon almost gave up near the end of my surgery, but he found a secret plane of dissection to peel the tumor off the nerves. And there was a Toronto neurophysiological monitoring tech watching my nerves closely the whole way. This is a picture of the hospital board where I kept track of my pain medications and the time of day it was. It's Mother's Day, and I know I'm going to get out of here soon and get back to my kids. Uh, this is what you eat after this kind of neurosurgery. I was back on pureed foods for many weeks, and it wasn't easy. Um, it's very hard to get out of bed, and it's very hard to walk, and my lungs kind of go down. So I really needed to dig deep here. Dr. Liu kicked me out of the hospital after two weeks. He said, it's better to go to this, the hotel and home. It's time for you to recover at home and start moving. The swelling gets really bad, and they're unsure if I'm going to need to go back into the operating room. Thankfully, I don't have to. I go back to the hotel, I shower, I try to get the mask out of my hair, I put on some makeup, and we go out for some dinner. And I will never forget how good it felt to eat real food after not eating for about three weeks. And that's the, the typical food that somebody can eat after they're learning how to swallow again. We get our COVID tests, trying to figure out how to get home. I can't fly because of the ear pain. So we decide we're going to Bonnie and Clyde that rental car across the border. We, we actually did make it home, um, and the Border Patrol asked us why we were coming back to Canada, and I said, you know, the this, Nisa, welcome home. <laughs> I'm home, back with my children, and they are the best medicine. My friends come over to visit, first they come in masks, and then they just get into bed with me. And being back with my kids is the best form of healing in medicine. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Good. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, well, basically, I'm really grateful to be here with you today on the other side of the mountain sharing my story with you. And I hope it was helpful in some way. Thank you for the opportunity. Clearly, I should have practiced.